pick up back in Romans chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and begin to turning there. The words will be on the screen if you don't. This morning, I want us to think about what it means to wait in this life. It's interesting this time of year because we have um, this season of back to school, and if you have children in your house or if you were a child ever before, you know that it's the same circumstance, right? Back to school, but depending on which side of the equation you're on, it's a different kind of waiting, right? So for the kids, you ask them this week, are you ready to go back to school? And they just look at you like, are you serious? School, homework, math, like, no, I'm not ready for that. But if you ask their parents, are you ready for school to start back? What, what, then you begin, I saw some adult faces lighting up like, yes, I would love for school to start back soon because that means that life goes back to a little more pattern and rhythm than it has been. Maybe you're not, maybe you're a better parent than me, but, um, but I thought about the idea of waiting a few times in the passage that we're going to read this morning. We're going to see this idea that, that we as believers live between two realities. We, we live between the reality of the gospel that Paul's been preaching and our relationship with God through Jesus that is absolute and final and, and works itself out in our lives. But we also live between Jesus calling us as his own disciples and the full, we'll call it revelation or appearing of Jesus's kingdom, right? And so we see what the world doesn't see right now. We see the, the king of kings who's ruling and reigning and in control, but everybody else doesn't see it that way yet. And so within the waiting period of what we call the already reality of the gospel and the not yet revealing of Jesus's kingdom. There's a lot of sometimes pain and there's a lot of suffering and there's struggles with sin we've been preaching and talking about and, and so many different things go on in our lives. And so it's an important thing for our discipleship for us to understand what it means to wait in between these two points, in, in between these two realities. And so this morning, we're gonna read the passage together and then we're gonna talk about two ways that Paul encourages us to wait as Christians. Number one, we're gonna see waiting by looking forward. And then number two, we're gonna see waiting by looking around. So I wanna invite you to read with me Romans chapter eight. We're gonna start in verse 18 and read all the way through verse 30. Paul says this, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Verse 26, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of the Lord this morning. Amen. Let's start by talking about how we as believers wait, eagerly wait, as Paul said, um, in verse 25, we hope for what we do not see. We wait for it with patience. We wait with that patience, number one, by looking forward to what God is going to do in the future. A, a huge part of what it means to be a believer in Christ is to have a future perspective 
on a big grand scale. This is why Paul begins this, this passage talking about uh, the sufferings of the present time and the glory that's gonna be revealed. And then he even goes into the reality that creation itself is eagerly waiting for God to finish the story for God to finish what was started. Now, Paul is rooting much of his discussion, much of what he's been saying. If you'll go all the way back to where he began to talk about those who are in Adam versus those who are in Christ, when here, when Paul says the creation has been subjected by God, that's a reference back to Genesis when when God cursed Adam and Eve for their sin and their rebellion. And and part of the consequence of the curse for their sin and rebellion was that, that, that the ground itself, Creation itself, the, the, the natural world around us has been impacted by sin in major ways. Now, we recognize in our own world that, that there's realities in nature that are beyond our control. Most of us live in a, in, in, right, we live in the, the pretty developed world where we don't deal with nature the same way that many people across the globe and many people in history of humanity have had to deal with nature. But the reality is if you had to give nature like a, a summary word, uncontrollable would be a good word, right? Like we're here and we know like we can blow fans and, and we can build air conditioners, but you go outside and there's not much you can do about the heat of the sun, right? Where we live, it's hot. And, and we know there's floods and natural disasters and tsunamis and hurricanes. And, and that, that for so many people who lived in, in, lived in and live in now agriculturally based societies, you're at the mercy of the rainfall and the mercy of, of droughts and, and feast and famine depends on the created order around. And so it's pretty easy for us to look around at the world and recognize that, that there's brokenness in that that creation itself wants to be renewed and restored. And I think that Paul would talk, yes, about the material, the physical realities, but I think Paul is also just including in this the reality that as we look outside of us, we recognize that things are not the way they're supposed to be, right? Like sinfulness causes this snowball effect in so many different ways. And so, I mean, open up the apps on your phone or or open up the tabs on your computer and read the news. And what do you see, man? Like the world is groaning for something to be different. The world has a deep desire for, as, as Russell said earlier, for peace. Like we recognize that. Most people that you have a conversation with recognize like, We understand that there should be peace and kindness and unity and these sorts of things. And then we look at the world around us and and that word groaning is really good to describe it. Have you ever picked up your phone and read a text message or an email or a news story or a Facebook post and and all you could do was just, oh, like groan, like this is... This is not the way that things should be. And this is what Paul is telling believers. He's saying, we recognize this as Christians. We recognize that there's a big story, that our faith is not just about our individual relationship with God. It's about our individual relationship with God, but it's so much bigger than that. God has everything under his control. And the whole story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is the story of God redeeming and restoring every broken thing. So I wanna encourage you with this this morning from this passage, the gospel gives you hope for the future restoration and renewal of all things, all things, period. The things that we see in the physical world that we recognize are broken and not the way that God has designed them. The gospel says, go read Revelation. Jesus is going to undo the the fallenness of creation. And, And not just that, the brokenness that we see in the world around us, the wars, the famines, the struggles that so many people deal with and live in, the reality is, what the Bible promises us and what Paul is teaching us is that there's coming this revelation of the kingdom of Jesus. And on that day, every tear is gonna be wiped away and every wrong thing is gonna be made right. This is the promise of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what does that do for us? Why is it important for us to understand this? You see, the bigger our picture of God's restoration of all things, the bigger our understanding of being able to look forward to God's plan the the more hope that we have in our day-to-day life. 
You see, when we begin to filter our own life circumstances through the big picture story of who Jesus is and what he's done, then we're able to look at those circumstances and say what what the world and the enemy uh, intended for evil, God is going to use for good. And we'll get more into that here in just a moment. But I wanna ask you, how often in your life as you're reading news stories or you're getting bad news or something happens in your day and you just feel overwhelmed with the groaning feeling, do you, do you stop and say, how can I filter this through the big story of what Jesus is doing? So what Paul's telling us is that, hey, look, your present day struggle and your present day sufferings don't compare. Do some comparison and contrast and go back to your English class back in high school or college, right? We're gonna compare and contrast two things. How are they alike and how are they different? And Paul says, do that with your struggle. Do that with the groanings of creation and the groanings of the world and recognize that there is no comparison. The future promises of Jesus far outweigh the brokenness of this, of this world and the brokenness that creation itself is groaning to be free from. So that's the first way we can wait by looking forward. But I want you to see that it's not just that. Not only does the gospel give you hope for the future restoration and renewal of all things, the gospel gives you hope for eternal acceptance, purpose, and position. Look with me at verse 23. Paul says this, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. Paul says that we look forward, yes, to the, to the big picture story of what God is doing in history, and that helps us, but we can also look forward to the big picture story of what God is doing to renew and restore us. That word adoption, um, Chad talked about last week, the intimacy that we have with our Father because of our relationship with Jesus through the Spirit. That, that idea of adoption means this, that we have eternal acceptance, purpose, and position. I want you to think about how good of news that is for us. The reality is, as you look at the world around us, those three things are three things that every human's looking for. Every human being wants acceptance and purpose and position. They wanna know that they're loved, they wanna know that they matter and they wanna know that their life matters, that there's, po- there's a point to all this. The reality is when you begin to take that hope of acceptance and, and position and purpose away from a person, then you begin to see how hopelessness can wreck people's lives. But, but here's what the gospel tells us, that, that because of what Jesus has done for us, those of us who have the first fruits of the spirit, we recognize what is coming for us in eternity. We recognize it's not already here, right? This is how Paul defines hope. It's an eager expectation of what's to come. We know it's coming, but we also recognize it's not fully here. Paul says, if you hope for something, you don't hope for something you already have, right? And so when I ordered, I ordered some shoes on the internet this week. And and I'll tell you, I'm not very patient when it comes to waiting. I'm not very good at it. And so I paid an extra dollar literally for hope because it was like three to five day business shipping. And then the second one was $1 more, but it was like maybe two to four day business <laughs> shipping. It was like, we're not going to make any promises. It literally said that. Like, we're, it may still be three to five days. I'm like, extra dollar, let's do it, right? Because that's what expectation is. Like, I know the package is coming, but I know it's not here yet. I don't have it here yet. And so this is what Paul's saying is a reality for us. Our adoption, though we have the first fruits, the first, the sealing of the spirit on our lives, and we realize that 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 hope that we have is coming, we, we recognize that it's not fully here yet. There's, there's a reality of a struggle of sin in our hearts, right? There's a reality of the fact that we still live in this broken world and that we still every day wake up and struggle uh, to feel accepted and to feel the purpose and position that God has given us. And so Paul says that we eagerly groan for that. And yet this is, this is what we're called to do. We wait with patience for this big picture of what God is doing in our hearts and our lives. So I wanna encourage us, the first way you can think about what it means to wait in light of the truth of the gospel and the truth of eternity that Jesus is bringing is that you look forward. And the greater you understand the big picture of what Jesus is doing, and the greater that you understand what it means that you've been adopted 
and that you have acceptance and purpose and position in Christ Jesus, then the greater you'll be able to live out the, the day-to-day. And that's the second thing I wanna get in this morning is that not only does Paul encourage us that we can wait by looking forward, but Paul says we can wait by looking around. The reality is that a lot of people will say about Christians that, that Christians or religious people have just created this idea of heaven so that they can feel good about themselves, right? So that maybe, maybe uh, you know, maybe life is pointless, but one day everything's gonna be okay, right? Like heaven's on the way. And so when we die, we go to heaven and everything's better. And, and that's part of our faith. We would never deny that we believe in heaven. We'd never deny that we believe in, in eternal restoration. But, but here's the greater truth that, that often people miss, that the gospel that we believe in is not just hope for the future, it really is power for dealing with our circumstances in the present day. And Paul shows us that in the text here. I want you to see a couple of things. Number one, we look around at our circumstances and we recognize that your weakness drives you to the source of your help. Look with me, verse 26. Paul says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Man, we could preach for weeks and weeks and years about that. But, but, it, but Paul keeps going on for, we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Verse 27, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Here's what we say to those people who would say your hope is only for heaven and that makes you feel better about yourself. We say, no, you see the the proof of our relationship with God is that we have the spirit in the moments and the days that we walk in. That, That it's the spirit and the power of the spirit at work in our hearts and our lives that gives us strength to deal with whatever circumstances come our way. And so Paul recognizes this. He says, look, in the waiting, we're gonna struggle. In the waiting, we're gonna become more and more aware every day of our own weakness. But here's the beauty. Our weakness as believers only drives us to a source of true strength through the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to think about the way that Paul describes the Holy Spirit right now. Number one, a helper for our weakness. But number two, that the Spirit himself groans. Paul's already used that word two times in this passage. The first time he says creation groans. The second time he says that we ourselves as believers groan for the future coming. But then the Holy Spirit himself is described as groaning. And look at that, groaning's too deep for words. Think about that for a moment, that God himself who dwells in you through the power of the Spirit groans for you to be made whole and groans for you to be strengthened in your weakness and groans for you to be able to depend on him on the days when it feels like you're gonna fall apart. Like the spirit himself has this deep groaning for the wholeness. And and we're told even this, this is beautiful, that, that the spirit, because he is one with the father and the son, that we have one God who exists in three persons, that he perfectly knows the will of God. And so even on the days when we don't know what to pray, like we remember what Jesus said, right? Like, Jesus said, pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus, even in the garden, what does he pray? Father, not my will, but your will be done. We know we're supposed to pray for God's will to be done, but there are days when we don't know what God's will is. There are days where we're just crushed under the weight of our circumstances. And so we say, we say, God, I don't even know what your will is in this situation. What am I supposed to be doing? What am I supposed to be, how am I supposed to be praying and living? And Paul says, Take heart, Christian, because the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, he knows the will of the Father. He knows the will of God in every circumstance, in every situation, and so he intercedes for you as a believer according to the will of God. Isn't that good news that God prays for us when we don't know what to pray for ourselves? I wanna wanna pause here and warn us that here's the reality. It'll only help us in the waiting period to be able to see the source of our help if we're willing to admit our weakness. Let me say that again. It'll only help us to be able to wait patiently if we're willing to see our weakness. We live in a world and a culture that tells us you can't have any weakness. 
that, that you have to be strong all the time, that weakness should be uh, despised and pushed away and only strength should be celebrated. And yet the call of Christianity is a call of saying, I don't have it all together. And I want you to think about that for a moment. When, when bad things happen in our lives, when trials come, when things are, are anxiety creating in our hearts and our souls, when you get bad news from the doctor, when you get, when you get told something you didn't want to be told, when work is not going your way, when everything seems to be going south, who in themselves has the strength to deal with those sorts of situations? And the world tells us you just got to like grin and bear it and find some inner deep strength. But but friends, in the circumstances and situations of life that are hard, who has that on their own? The world wants us to deny that we have any weakness, but, but what Paul is telling us uh, is the point that we recognize we're weak is when God shows himself strong. And this is why Paul in other places in the New Testament even says, hey, I don't boast in all the good gifts that God's given me. I don't boast in all the things I'm really good at. I boast in my weaknesses. I boast in those things that I don't have it all together. Why? Because where I'm weak, that's where God gets to show that he's really, really, really strong. We sing it as little kids, right? Yes, Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. We like to think we grow out of that weakness, but the reality is, as Paul says right here, no, listen, The Spirit helps us in our weakness, but I want to challenge us because if we refuse to be honest and humble and recognize that we have weakness, we'll never be able to tap into the spiritual power of the Holy Spirit. It's in humility and embracing our weaknesses that we can lean into understanding the way that I'm going to have to wait and be patient through this circumstance is by depending on Jesus, depending on the Spirit. So we wait by looking around, seeing that our weakness drives us to the source of our help. But not only that, we, we wait by looking around, real, realizing that our circumstances connect us to God's good plan. Read verse 28 with me. You probably already have it memorized, but I want to read it again because it's some of the most beautiful words in all of, all of history and all of scripture. Verse 28, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are, all, who are called according to his purpose. Here's the, the truth. Oftentimes people try to take this passage and they twist it around and take it out of its context. And, 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 and if you read it just by itself, it kind of sounds like everything should always be good for Christians, right? Well, if you're a Christian, the, all things work together for your good, right? And so, so everything should be good. It should be rainbows and butterflies and prosperity and peace and and wealth, and, and all the comfort of this life. And, and that would be fine if that verse was by itself, but the very context that we've been reading is Paul saying, hey, you have to hope for what you don't see and wait for it with patience. And then he comes in and says, but know this, that all of these things, all of our weaknesses, all of our struggles, all of our trials, all of our brokenness in the world around us, all of that is working together for our good. So number one, Don't be deceived into believing that this is a promise of earthly prosperity when in reality the the text says all things, meaning that all things can happen to Christians. Death, disease, brokenness, poverty, all, all things that you can imagine can happen to believers. And so don't be twisted into believing that this is a promise for earthly prosperity. But the second thing I wanna warn us against is, is warning us against imposing our own definition of the word good on God. And here's what I mean by that. Often we take this and we feel like, God, you're letting me down because this situation and circumstances, I don't feel how this is working together for my good. And the problem is that our definition of God, I mean, our definition of good doesn't necessarily always equal and line up with God's definition of good. In fact, God's definition of good is so much higher and better than ours that it's, it's really hard for us to comprehend on our own. And so, so here's the reality. Part of the reason that we're so impatient in the world around us is because we have a definition of that word good, right? Like, think about it like this. There's, there's two restaurants, right? But you're really hungry. And one of them will take you, you know, 45 minutes to an hour just to get a table, 
And one of them is called McDonald's. And you can be through there in 15 minutes, right? Your definition of good might greatly depend on how hungry you are in the moment, right? You say, oh, yeah, that burger sounds pretty good over there, but I am hungry, so I'm gonna go get an okay burger. And this is what we do in our lives. We, we recognize our own definition of good and we impose it on this. And we say, God, why are you not giving me the immediate good that I want? Rather than recognizing that there's a deeper eternal good that God is working your circumstances for, but it comes through the waiting, it comes through the patience. It comes through what Chad preached last week, that word suffering, that that sometimes we, in our, in our prosperous uh, economy, in our prosperous culture, we, we misunderstand why the Bible talks so much about suffering. The reality is, is, is that it's easy for us to believe that God's just trying to make us suffer just to suffer. When what Paul is teaching in this passage, in this verse, is that what God is doing with all things that happen to us is, is sovereignly working them together to give us something good at the end of the story. And you can see this illustrated in many parts of the Bible, right? You see it in the story of Joseph, whose brothers beat him up and sell him into slavery. And, and they think they're done with him, right? And at the end of his life, he's become basically the king of Egypt. His brothers are going through a famine. They come to him and, and they're like, this guy has every right to kill us. And what, is, what does Joseph say? No, 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 what, what you intended for evil to wreck me, God used for good to save us. And this is how God works. And we see it in all sorts of stories. We see it in the story of Israel and we see it in the story of David and Abraham and Old Testament stories. And then you get to this Jesus guy, right? In the New Testament, in the gospels. And if anyone could say that evil happened to them, it's Jesus who was unjustly put on trial. He was beaten and tortured, even though the, the authorities confessed he's not sinned, he's not done anything wrong. And he's nailed to the cross. He, he bleeds out and suffocates on the cross unjustly and unfairly. And, and you say, well, well, what's going on? And on the cross, Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Why? Because what the people around Jesus intended for evil, God was orchestrating for ultimate good. And so here's why I challenge us to see this, that, that as painful as it may feel at points and as hard as waiting may be, the promise of this passage is that your circumstances, even the circumstances that you would have never chosen, that, that you despise, waiting for each of us looks differently. Some of us are waiting for things to come that aren't here yet, like relationships or jobs or the next stages of life. Some of us are waiting for things that are in our lives to be gone from our lives, from, from broken relationships and, and circumstances and diseases and pain and all these different things. And so, so waiting looks different in different situations, but here's the promise of what Paul is saying, that all of those circumstances connect you to God's big plan and they connect you to God's purpose. That's what it means that all these things are working together for the good. And, and then that gets us into verses 29 and 30, where we're told for, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among, among many brothers. And those whom God predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Uh, there's a lot that we could say about this. And sometimes people, again, like to take these verses out of their context and make them say things that maybe Paul didn't intend for them to mean. But, but here's what I think if you study what Paul's doing. Why does Paul say this? Why does Paul go into foreknowledge and predestination and justification and glorification and calling? Why does he do that? Well, here's what Paul wants us to see, that our relationship with Jesus is absolute and not up in the air. This is why Paul encourages us with these passages. I mean, look at, the, look at the tense of the words in verse 30. Those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. We say, Paul, what do you mean we're already glorified? Why did Paul use a past tense word for glorified? We know, right, our bodies aren't fully glorified. Paul, you've already said that we're waiting on, our, our, on the redemption of our bodies when Jesus reveals his kingdom. Well, what's Paul doing? He's intentionally saying, your glorification in the eyes of God is as good as done. Rest assured that your justification in the eyes of God because of Jesus' work is as good as gold. It's done. 
in God's eyes, our salvation and glorification and justification is complete. And so this is what Paul's saying. We can wait and we can look, look around at the circumstances around us and say, okay, whatever comes this week, whatever news I get, whatever pain I walk through, the mountaintops that are really exciting and the valleys that are really low, I know this, that I belong to Jesus. And because I belong to Jesus, as an absolute certainty that all of these circumstances God is using to connect me to his good plan. So praise team, you can go ahead and come. We're gonna wait this week, I hope, by looking forward to what God's doing. Not only can we look forward and grow in our big picture knowledge of what Jesus is doing, and we do that by looking at God's word and having conversation with God's people, but we can also not just say, one day God's gonna make all these things better. We can say, how can I filter and view the, the reality of my circumstances as God connecting me to his big picture plan? That's my challenge to us this week. In conclusion, I'll just ask you, what are you waiting for? I want you to think about that. And I want you to, to really, really think about it because like I said, there's no way for me or any of us to know the depths of your heart, what you're waiting for. Maybe you're waiting for that next stage of life to come. Maybe you're waiting for a new job, a new place to live. Maybe you're waiting for something different. Maybe you've, you're waiting for pain in your heart and your soul and in your brain to be gone forever. Maybe you're waiting for the Lord to take away a sin struggle. Maybe you're waiting for for just anything. It could be so many different circumstances, but I want you to think about in your heart and your soul, what is it right now that's dominating my thought and dominating the patterns of, of how I operate my life? And then I wanna ask you this question. Can you this week, can you today look forward to God's big plan? And can you think about that thing that you're waiting for and say, how does God's big plan impact what I'm waiting for? And not only that, can you look at that circumstance and situation and can you say, okay, what are the ways that this is driving me to need the Spirit's help? What are the ways that this weakness, this burden, this pain is driving me to the source of strength? And then ask this, how is this circumstance connecting me to the good that God has for me? Brothers and sisters, when we can do that in our circumstances, then the next step is this, God will then call us to be able to be ministers of reconciliation and to look at a world around us that's looking for purpose and acceptance and position and be able to say to them, hey, let me tell you the big picture story and then let me tell you how your story can fit into God's story. That's my prayer for us this week at Tapestry this morning. Let me pray for you, church, and then I'll turn it over to the praise band. Father, we thank you that you have given us good gifts. We thank you that your word says, Every good and perfect gift is from above. Lord, I thank you for your word. Yes, it challenges us, but Lord, what an encouragement is this passage to our lives, Lord, that all things are working together for our good. Even the most broken thing we can think of in our week, you're using for our good. And what the enemy means for evil, you're turning to good. And Lord, what we feel like we can't overcome, your spirit is our source of strength. Thank you, Jesus. Father, go with us today as we continue to celebrate our faith, family, and community. Keep us safe as we travel. Lord, just help us to have a wonderful day encouraging one another and equipping one another to follow Jesus. Pray this in your precious name.